I'm Jay Fernandez. Welcome to this rare in the trenches look at the craft of screenwriting. Today I'm sitting here with Robin Swicord, who's written the screenplays for Little Women, The Perez Family, and Memoirs of a Geisha. She also adapted the Roald Dahl novel Matilda with her screenwriter husband Nick Kazan, and she's currently directing her debut feature, The Mermaid Singing, from her own script. Robin, glad to have you here. Glad to be here. So you studied theater at Florida State University. Did you write a lot of plays at that time? No, they had a, just a, a, a kind of a baby playwriting program just being started there. And I was doing a double major of English and theater, and I sort of focused in theater more on the technical aspects. That's what I was interested in. Oh, really? Like uh, sets and directing? Right. Oh, okay. Stagecraft. Okay. Well, when did you first try your hand at writing in script form then? I probably started writing in dialogue when I was about 20, after Florida State. I would, had been writing a lot of prose before then, but I found that I was more and more drawn to dramatic writing. And so I started writing for myself, but in script form, mostly towards screenwriting because I had worked as a photographer to put myself through college and I was interested more in the visual aspects oh, I see. Than, uh, than I could find, you know, working in the theater. Interesting, but, but yet you were also expressing yourself artistically through writing. I had always been writing. I started writing as soon as I could pick up a pencil, but I had been oriented toward novels and short stories and that kind of thing, because that was what we studied in school. I didn't really know that movies were written <laughs> until I was uh, probably about 20 years old. Actually, one of the great things about Florida State and the job that I had was that I could go down and look at films while the, my prints were drying before I turned them in mm. um, at night working for this newspaper. And I would go down and see um, quite a bit of film or, or quite a bit of one movie and then take a break and see a, a good bit of another movie. So somewhere in there, I saw screen credits go by and I realized that there was a writer at work that had been there before everybody else. And then I started thinking, well, I could do that. Did you immediately start uh, transitioning your writing to that format then? I mean, did you, were you Right, after I got out of college, or? I did. I started writing more dramatic stuff and I stopped thinking so much about prose. I was intimidated because I didn't really have a teacher and I didn't really know how to get started. And it was that thing of being in a small town and knowing that there was a big world out there, not knowing quite how to get out of that small town and go to the big world, knowing that I wanted to write for film, but I'd never met a filmmaker. Right. You know, so it was, there was a period of kind of self-invention where I was just trying to figure stuff out. And we didn't have, the, then there weren't the things that are so available now, like all the books on structure and right. you know, interview series like this where you hear writers talking about their work and just being able to go in and rent a DVD and study one filmmaker's work. I had to always be looking for a screening of a movie and if there might be a movie I'd always heard about but I would never have an opportunity to see it unless it just happened to show it at the school where I was studying. Interesting, so how did you learn this, the structure and the format then? Where did you, where did you pick that up? I think some of it was through osmosis, and then I had the very lucky thing that I sold a screenplay, um, and we can talk a little bit about how that happened if you like, but I sold a screenplay, and I stepped into the most remarkable situation, which I call uh, learn while you earn, which is that I was paid by MGM to rewrite my screenplay endlessly under the tutelage of a wonderful um, development executive named Lynn Arist, who basically patiently let me find my way to, to decent structure. Wow. <laughs> and I, I would imagine that's not a very common experience. It was an uncommon, uncommon experience for a beginning screenwriter, and I know how lucky I was. Was that the first feature you had written then? Was that the first feature-length script? No, I had written something before that that I never showed anyone that I knew wasn't good. But this was the first one that I thought, well, I think this is a story, and I will try to sell this. So on your second try though, you, you got in the door then, that's pretty... Yeah, but you have to keep in mind that when you read that beginning baby screenplay now, it wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they bought it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but so then it, was it never produced then? Never produced, okay. it was called Stock Cars for Christ. Stock Cars for Christ, I like it. Right, it was a, obviously a comedy. Uh, what was the, the storyline? 
the storyline was it was thematically about hero worship, and it was about a, a young man who, um, at the beginning of this movie, accidentally, in trying to sort of hot dog with his car, takes his car off a bridge and it lands on a ski jump where some bathing beauties are arrayed having their picture taken, and he is now, you know, responsible for the slaughter of all of these girls, and he goes to jail. And when he, what, when, he, when he gets out of jail, he decides to dedicate himself to something bigger than himself. And he finds it in this person who he has um, sort of worshipped from afar, who is um, a stock car driver, a NASCAR driver. And this gentleman, Sonny, Sonny True, goes through a terrible fire crash and is completely scarred all over, but goes through a conversion, a religious conversion and puts together a kind of passion play, which is performed at NASCAR races. And this boy, uh, Ulysses, goes to sort of get this man back on his feet and help him realize his dream, but he himself is not religious. And so it's a kind of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hero worship story. Well, you, you think you really soft pedaled that, that first uh, project there, <laughs> jeez. Where did that come from? That's insane. My sick imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, they say, write what you know. <laughs> <laughs> you also had some, uh, some plays produced off-Broadway, right? I mean, wh I did. where does that happen in the timeline? Then? It was before that. What happened was that I, I was making small films and trying to teach myself to be a filmmaker. And I was doing it in this milieu of Northwest Florida, and where there isn't really a film business, obviously. Um, and I ended up being in Atlanta and doing this kind of work for hire where you might do a little corporate film. That in my case, I went to, uh, I, I took some slides that were used to teach a computer language at IBM. And I assembled a kind of teaching tool for them. And something about the voice of that narration or whatever got me a meeting with somebody at IBM who then asked their ad agency in New York if they would hire me as a copywriter. So I went to New York, I had a job waiting for me. Wow. And, you know, I had a lot to learn about the advertising business, but that wasn't my goal. My goal was to become a filmmaker. And so I went around and met as many people as I could in New York City who were involved in film, and I got a lot of the same advice, which was that as a woman, if I were interested in filmmaking, I should be what's called a script girl or a script supervisor. D-girl. Not even D-girl, just if I wanted to be on a set, that the job that there was for me was going to be as a script supervisor. Wow, what time period are we talking about here? Like, like 78, 79, wow. 80. And so I knew that that wasn't what I was talking about. Um, but I got in contact with some people who had come out of Florida State um, a little bit after me, who we're in New York City and hoping to start a theater. And so I said, I'll write a play for you. And so we, I wrote this play called Last Days at the Dixie Girl Cafe. Mm -hmm. And we had like $500 between us. And we rented the theater and we put an ad in Backstage Magazine, I mean newspaper, yeah. Yeah. Uh, weekly. And actors showed up and auditioned. And you know, then, they, then we were in business. We were, we were putting on this play. Wow. And through the ad agency, there was a gentleman there named Len Fink, who was an art director, who later, many, many years later, he invented those Fandango paper puppets. He now has that uh, company. But he was a real live art director who helped us design a poster. And then I went around with wheat paste at night and put them up all around New York City. Wow, very DIY. Absolutely. And, this, and we called up the newspapers constantly and said, please come review this play. And finally, people did come, and it, you know, it moved to, you know, it had a nice opening, and then it moved to Off-Broadway because investors found it and so forth. And through that, an agent saw the play and got in touch with me and said, did you ever consider writing for film? And so I gave her my first screenplay, Star okay, Cars for so Christ. Cat, okay. And so I was just completely, you know, mid-20s, just trying to figure out my own path and how to get there. And I, I'm definitely an autodidact, and I still feel that I'm teaching myself to write. You right. know, and nothing has changed since then except that I now get paid for what I do. Yeah, there's no point where you hit and say, oh, well, now... Now I'm, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that first uh, play, 
was that, was that challenging for you? I mean, was it difficult to write? I mean, how did you approach it? Was, it? it was very much a challenge, and I was lucky that the director of that um, is a good dramaturg. Her name was Lynn Thompson. She was actually the dramaturg on the musical Rent. I saw her name oh, in the paper wow. many years later. But she was teaching directing and um, screen um, playwriting, I believe, at Hunter College. And so she was part of that group of people that got interested in starting a theater company. And I think that she taught me a lot about um, writing plays. And then a lot of it gets taught to you by actors in the rehearsal process. Mm, right. You start There's to see what doesn't work. And that's one of the wonderful things about working in the theater. There's this artificial divide in film in which writers are always kind of artificially kept separate from the actors. But in fact, so much can happen in the rehearsal room that can make the work better and you know, with the actors feeding writers and writers feeding actors. Well, so are you then, because of that, those experiences, not as precious about your, your words on the page because you know they're going to change and potentially get better? Or are you pretty protective? I, I don't mind when actors play with the language. A lot of times it gets better. But I wouldn't say that I'm not protective because I know that you've heard in other interviews in these, the same series that we all go through this process in which people are constantly telling you how you can make your screenplay better. And sometimes you get good advice, but sometimes the advice isn't good and doesn't help the writing. And then you have to sort of know when to sort of, you know, step back and say, no, I, I'm going to be careful here. Well, what happened then when you transitioned to feature writing from, from playwriting? Uh, how was it different? And w without that rehearsal period and the evolution of it, was it, how was it different writing on your own completely just? Well, since I've spent my life writing my own completely, it wasn't so difficult. But I definitely did miss the rehearsal period. And I, if I could change um, one thing about the creative process of film, I would say that it should be institutionalized that actors come in and read work aloud because we mm -hmm. are dramatists. And we don't always know when something works or doesn't work on the page. It's very instructive to hear casting tapes. Mm. You hear the stuff aloud and you think, wow, that speech is too long, or wow, that's just not clear enough yet. You know, so unfortunately, very often, we know these things as writers, but we're not in the rehearsal room to make the changes when necessary. Do you ever do any, anything to that effect on your own? You know, play some of your dialogue back and forth with someone else or within you? Right, well, sometimes we'll like pull people together and have a reading. We did that on Matilda, my husband and I. Can you give an example of, of how it helped in that context specifically with Matilda? Well, I think in Matilda, one of the things that we noticed um, were that some of the roles were underwritten, that we had focused on certain characters more than others. And there's nothing like having everyone assembled and having a wonderful actor to play, you know, the mother, for instance, and realizing that we haven't given her very much to do or say. <laughs> and then it just makes it easier. You think, oh, well, I, I need to give this person some big moments. You said you made a, a, you know, you made those shorts for like IBM and, and right. Would you suggest to a prospective screenwriter that they that they try a short first, or, or a writer, a prospective writer director that they they start with a short form? I think that you should make as much film as you possibly can, <laughs> long and short. But I don't think that it's good to start screenwriting without having at least carried a camera around. Really? I think you really have to teach yourself to see the world cinematically in order to write cinematically. The thing that I think that's poorly understood about screenwriting from people who aren't close to the film business is that screenwriters don't just write the dialogue. We don't just make up the story and structure the dramatic beats, but we also describe the images on the page, which are then translated into film images by everybody else. And carrying a camera, which I did for many years, um, really taught me to see the world in terms of photographs. And it, was, um, it gave me a leg up, I think, in learning to write visually. Um, much of what you've had produced has been an adaptation. I mean, what do you like about adaptations versus writing specs? I like the conversation with the other writer. That's something that you get out of coming to, particularly a novel, is that there's another writer's mind there. And there's a kind of exploration that you're doing of this person's mind and their story and their characters. And I come to it a bit more as an actor comes to a role. Mm. How and, so? In that I'm trying to analyze the text 
and to find what's hidden there. And that I'm taking on characters that don't come from inside me, that come from inside another writer. And I'm trying to bring myself to that almost um, at an interpretive level. Mm. Okay, so you start from the interpretive rather than breaking it down by scene or... I mean, no, how do you... Eventually you have to do that, eventually. But I think that the first part, for me at least, is trying to have a deeper understanding of the, the novel than you might just have on a first read and to understand what the book is about thematically and understand um, who the protagonist might be. And since narrative writing is not dramatic writing, there's a certain kind of transition that has to happen in terms of how that person who's the central character in the book really becomes the protagonist in a drama. Mm. And so some of it is analysis, and then some of it is just feeling your way toward the book and the material. And something like Little Women, I did a lot of background reading because that book in particular, um, for Louisa May Alcott, had strong autobiographical elements. Okay. And so I went to her family and what was known about her family through her letters, people's diaries, what was written about that family. The transcendentalists, trying to set them in their time, and then trying, I actually went and got um, diaries written during that time. There was kind of a fad that if you took the Overland Trail to the West, that you wrote a diary. Even if you never kept a diary in real life, you might keep one on that trip because it was such this unusual thing. It was like going into outer space. Yeah, what an adventure. What yeah. an adventure. And so a lot of these diaries are kept in libraries now. And so you can read them and then you get the vernacular speech of that time. Because, oh, right. of, you know, and so since um, Louisa May Alcott was a genre writer mostly, and she wasn't attempting to write dialogue that was true to the ear, I had to go find those voices and then kind of bring that, you know, to, to my adaptation of her book. Oh, interesting. I mean, how faithful do you feel you need to be to the book? I mean, how, how do you... How do you balance that interpretation when you're... You know, that's one of the great questions about adaptation. Sometimes books are not a really natural fit dramatically, and that and more invention is required. Um, I think I, I try to stay faithful to the underlying material, to the intention of the author as much as I can. Unfortunately, that's not always borne out as it goes through production. Right. I was very lucky with Little Women to be a producer and to be involved all the way through. And I was very lucky in our choice of director, Jillian Armstrong, with that as well, that she had grown up with the book and really loved it. And her goals were very similar to mine. And so in a situation like that, you can be faithful to the text, even if you're departing here and there from the story, even if you're leaving things out, there's still an essential truth of the novel that the film is trying to get to. Um, and in other adaptations that I've done, it almost is irrelevant what my work was because people came behind me then and interpreted the story differently. And so... You're talking about like director and yes, you know, once yeah. it goes into Once it goes on, and of course that's the... Directing is an interpretive art as well. And so that's the risk that you take when you don't direct things yourself is that whoever comes behind you and is interpreting it may skew the film away from the thing that you were trying so hard to preserve of the book. When you're trying to establish the, the truth of, of what the original author was trying to, uh, trying to say, have you ever reached out to that writer? I mean, obviously you couldn't do it in the case of Little Women, but with like Golden and, uh, and Geisha. I did my best with Little Women. <laughs> yeah, I reached did you out in every way that the... I could. <laughs> right. Yes, um, I have. On When I did the Perez family, although that um, the film turned out differently than the screenplay did, I did work very closely with the, with the author Christine Bell, wonderful okay. writer, who took me through all of her haunts in Miami and introduced me to people who had been the models for various characters and really put me into that world. And I could use her as a resource, and I did. And the same thing was true with Arthur Golden on Memoirs of a Geisha. With Alice Hoffman on Practical Magic, we did have some early conversations, and she was helpful. But I soon found that I was thinking, having to think about 
things at the story level in a way that had nothing to do with the way a novelist would think about something. Okay. An example from that I can tell you is that in her wonderful book, Practical Magic, there are two um, older aunts or great aunts who are witches, right. and they speak in unison. Oh. And so I had to write two separate characters that had names and ages and a relationship with each other. Whether or not they spoke in unison, they weren't going to be the same person the way they could appear to be on the page. They would be handled by two different, we hoped, wonderful actors. And so in trying to get to elicit from her, well, who was older or younger? Well, what are their names and so forth? These were things that she had never thought about. <laughs> and so she couldn't answer them. And so you have to allow yourself to move away. And we moved very far away, as it turned out, from her um, novel, which was set in kind of suburban Boston. In the end, after a really terrible abortive first draft, we realized that we needed it to, to set it someplace that ha allowed more magic to happen, sort of naturally. And then, of course, that went through a, 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 a drastic reinterpretation when Griffin Dunn came on as the director and okay. hired other writers. I see. If you're veering from the established text, how do you decide on the say, newer tone of the dialogue, like you were talking about Little Women, for example. Right. You sounded like you were drawing more from historical documents than the language she was actually using in the book. Right. I was trying for a more relaxed human speech that would sound different from contemporary speech, would sound as if, as if it came from its time, but wouldn't be the stiffer genre dialogue that we often see on the page in not just Little Women, but all those books that were aimed at a young audience in the 19th century. Those books had a kind of teaching quality to them. Mm. And so we needed to move slightly away from that, but I didn't want to go so far that I was making something removed from the book. And so that's why I looked at her diaries and letters and looked at letters that her fa the father had written to the daughters and so forth, just trying to find you know, that literate New England speech of its time that was natural human speech. Do you do that level of research like that and going to Miami for uh, the Perez family even on your, your specs? I mean, do you do that level of like experiential absorption? As much as I possibly can, I do. Did you do it on your, your stock cars for Christ? Yes, I did. Oh, what did, what did you do for that? I went around the... and met a lot of drivers. I hung out in Talladega. Huh. I met young hot rod drivers who were the right age of um, Ulysses and just spent time with them and watched them work on their cars and so forth. Wow. That must be just interesting that, uh, on its own merits, but I mean, do you, yeah. do you actually get stories that you'll actually take and put in your script? I mean, things that you witness or, or is it Cer more just... Certainly I get behavior and language, which is mostly what I'm after. <laughs> right. Right. Because sto story is story. You know, you could do King Lear set in so many different, right. Menu, right? Right, right? But in terms of the specifics of the people, if they're not you, you have to go find out who they are. Was there a point with the adaptations where you felt like you really got better at it? Or you reached some new, like, revelatory point I, with them? I'm still hoping for that day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I was very relieved when I began to be considered for adaptation, actually, because I was one of those bookish, nerdish girls, mm -hmm. and I always um, adapted when I was a child. One of the things really? that I did to amuse myself was after I read a book, I would make paper dolls, and I would make sets and costumes, and I would enact the books that I loved. Wow, so you really were from an early age. From a very early age, the weird right? girl in the corner whispering to herself. <laughs> So um, I was happy that I could have a career in which I could do both my own stories and also, you know, to adapt.